Good evening, sisters and brothers, and welcome <coughs> to this evening's evening prayer. It's Tuesday evening, Tuesday evening, Tuesday the uh, 28th of June. And so let's come to give God thanks for His mercy and grace to us in sustaining us through the day. And for his protection throughout the coming night. Let's pray. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. O blessed are you, Lord God, creator of day and night. To you be praise and glory forever. As darkness falls, you renew your promise to reveal among us the light of your presence. By the light of Christ, your living word, dispel the darkness of our hearts, that we may walk as children of light and sing your praise throughout the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen that this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Now, behold, the dwelling of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And the one who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever Amen. I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God. And this canticle, of course, is from Revelation chapter 21. We look forward, sisters and brothers, to the day when there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more weeping, no more death, for the former things have passed away. That is our hope. That is what we long for that day, <clears throat> when the kingdom of God comes in fullness on this earth. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. Lead me in the path of your commandments that I may see the wonders of your law. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. And our evening collect. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening, and day is drawing to a close. 
abide with us and with your whole church in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us and with all your faithful ones, O Lord, in time and in eternity. Amen. Amen. All right, our, our psalm this evening is Psalm number 50, Psalm 50. Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, <coughs> speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens proclaim his righteousness. For he is a God of justice. Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. And call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. But to the wicked person, God says, What right have you to recite my laws? Or take my covenant on your lips. You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him. You throw in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You sit and testify against your brother and slander your own mother's son. When you did these things and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. But I now arraign you and set my accusations before you. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me, and to the blameless I will show my salvation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. One of the things I like about this particular psalm is, the, is God's, as it were, claim on everything. Everything is mine, says the Lord. He says, verse 12, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Let's remember that, sisters and brothers, you claim that something is yours. <laughs> God says, the world is mine and everything in it. That includes you and I and everything 
we own, quote unquote. This is a reality, sisters and brothers, that we don't own anything. We don't own anything in this world. Everything belongs to God and what we have is entrusted to us as stewards to care for it. Um, I love the fact that it talks about nature, doesn't it? Every animal of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills, every bird in the mountain, every insect in the field. It's God's way of saying all of nature is mine. Now we are entrusted to look after it. We are entrusted to care for it. The things we have, nature, including nature, but it's not ours to exploit or use as we see fit. Everything belongs to God. The whole world is mine and all that is in it. We are mere stewards. We are mere tenants. We are mere trustees. Caring for, looking after. But it doesn't belong to us. You know, I've said, even my child is entrusted to me by God to care for and to ensure that he grows according to God's standards. He's not mine. <laughs> He's God's. And everything I have is his. And he has, has loaned it to us, loaned them to us, so that we can be good stewards. So at the end of our lives, if we are faithful in our stewardship of the world, God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your, king, of your Lord. Yes? But it's not ours. It's God's. Everything in the world, the whole world is mine and all that is in it. Let's hold on to that tonight, sisters and brothers. Anytime you start thinking that you own something in this world, remember that it's not yours, it's God's. We are mere trustees, stewards, entrusted to be faithful. All right, Romans chapter 9 is our next reading tonight. We finish this chapter 9 of Romans. Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory even us whom he also called not only from the Jews but also from the Gentiles as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And 
in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel, who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So last night we started looking at this amazing chapter of Romans chapter 9 where Paul is talking about this God's sovereign choice. God has always chosen a people for his own. Um, God's special love is only for some people, not for everybody. There's a, there's a general love that God has for everybody, what, what theologians call common grace. But there is a special grace that God bestows only on those whom he chose. And that's the point of Romans chapter 9. And I said last night, sisters and brothers, that a lot of people doesn't a lot of people don't like the doctrine of election because it 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 it, it does two things. It takes away any boasting from us. You know, are you telling me that I had nothing to do with my salvation? And yes, I am saying exactly that. Your salvation is completely and totally a result of God's choice of you, God's grace. God chose you long before you chose him. You see, your choice, my choice of God was in response to God's choice of me. So th that is the point here. God's choice is sovereign. But remember, Paul began talking about this regarding Israel. Because he's concerned that Israel has gone astray. The people of God of the Old Testament have rejected the Messiah. They've rejected the gospel. And Paul is incensed. Paul is saying, why Lord? But Paul's point is that, well, the, the point is, God has always chosen some. And so even though they may be called Israel, not all Israel is Israel. Not everyone who bears the name of an Israelite is true in God. Why? Because God has always chosen some. And the, the entire history of God's redemptive work is that he's always chosen a remnant from the world, from the people, and so forth. He chose Abraham, he chose Isaac over Ishmael, he chose Jacob over Esau, and it goes on throughout history. And so even here at the very end, where Paul is quoting Isaiah, he says, Isaiah cries out, Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. Sisters and brothers, we can't get it any clearer. You know, Paul's point is, it's not all of Israel that's going to be saved. Why? Because from that group of people called Israelites or Jews, God has selected some. God has chosen some. 
But Paul's point is that that is how God has worked throughout history. And so even those among the Gentiles who are saved, not all Gentiles are going to be saved either. But God will choose some Gentiles. So salvation will come the same way for Jews as it does for Gentiles by faith in Jesus Christ. But it's because of the choice, the sovereign choice of God, why anyone is going to be saved. Now, and I want to finish with these two, because Paul anticipated two objections. And it's the two objections that we always have to this doctrine. Anytime people hear that God chooses some and not others, there are two objections that comes in. The first one, Paul deals with in verse 14. What shall we say? Is God unjust? Is God unjust? If God choose some and not others, does that show that he's an unjust God? He only chooses them what he wants, those whom he wants, and he leaves the others. Or he hardens, as he says, he hardens some and he has mercy on others. Is that unjust? And Paul's point is that God has the prerogative to show his mercy to whom he wants to show mercy, verse 18, and he can harden whom he wants to harden. Why? Because he is a sovereign God. <laughs> it just makes perfect sense that if he's a sovereign God, he can do whatever he wants with his mercy and his grace. And there is nothing that says he must have mercy and grace on everybody. So he chooses to have mercy and grace on some, and he chooses not to have mercy and grace on others. There is no injustice there. God didn't do anybody a disservice by not choosing them. In fact, it's his choice that makes the ones who were chosen precious in his sight. The second objection, second objection is verse 19. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? If I am not chosen, why am I still responsible for my sin? Why does God still blame us for not being, for not exercising faith, for not being his children? If I, am a, if I am saved because of God's choice of me, why does God blame those, why does God hold them responsible? That is a big question, sisters and brothers. Paul gives us a snippet of his answer here, but the answer is bigger. In chapter 10, he talks a little bit more about that. And chapter 11. But here he simply says, Who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? And basically what Paul is saying is that we are, we are objects and God is our creator. And God creates us as he so see fit. Basically, Paul comes back down to the fact that God is sovereign. And he can do whatever he wants. And so we, our response to God's sovereignty is worship. And that's what he's going to do later on. We don't question God's acts. Because we don't have, we don't have God's perspective. We don't have God's wisdom. We don't, we don't have a fraction of God's mercy and so forth. So we don't question God's choices. We simply humbly worship and accept those choices, especially if you are chosen. <laughs> I know the next question is, how do I know I'm chosen? Well, if you, if you love Jesus, you are. That's all I can say. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... Thank you that we who, we who are sinners, we who have been alienated from you, we who are enemies of God, have been brought near, have been drawn in by the power of your Spirit. You, you have chosen us 
from before the foundation of the world to be conformed to your image. And so, Lord, this grace, we are eternally grateful for a grace that look beyond our need and our flaws and rest upon us anyway, even though we did not deserve it. Not only that we didn't deserve grace, but we deserved hell. We deserved your wrath. And yet, in your mercy, you have lavished upon us grace. And so we can come and cry out to you and worship you because of what you have done for us and in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for those in our community and those in our world. We want to pray for those on our prayer list. We pray for Jean and Hannah, Comfort and Crystal, Wendy, Dion, Jane, Sue, Andrew, Keith, Daisy, Johanna, Mokund, Maxine, Pat, Rona, and Keog, Ryan, Muriel, Thelma, David, and Bernadette, Dolly, and Desmond, Veronica, Chester, Nadine, Pauline, Roy, and the family, Doreen, Andy, and Anita, Maxine and her children, Tavern, Salima, Selvi, Glynis and Bob and Claire in Upminster, and, <clears throat> and Jean and Walter and Monica and Auntie Jane. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so we have our night prayer, our evening prayer, as we say good night. Merciful God, we entrust to your unfailing and tender care this night. Those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold us safe. Comfort and heal them, we pray and restore them to health and strength. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord watch over you and protect you. May the Lord give you peace and comfort tonight, sisters and brothers, as you sleep. May the Lord give you rest from the troubles of this day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, sisters and brothers.